Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Ms. Reynolds. Good morning. Now, you and I have met a number of times. A few times, yes. Okay, right. Um, I was at your lab on October 4th uh, last year. Yes. With the uh, members of my fellow members of the team here? Yes. Right, yes. And then I met you back at your lab on February 28th to review ASCLAD documents, accreditation documents. Correct. Right. And uh, we said hello this morning outside and yesterday, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, in fact, you actually uh, pretty much run the, what, what would be the trace evidence area of the crime lab? Yes, I am the supervisor of the trace evidence. Okay. Section. And trace evidence is very important in terms of possible giving you evidence in terms of a crime. Right. Yes, there are types of evidence that we can examine. And trace evidence is called trace evidence because uh, it can be left by a perpetrator uh, at the crime scene, correct? Um, it's called trace evidence because it's um, usually, typically, the smaller stuff that is left either behind or is transferred during the commission of a crime. Right. And it's, it, it can be very small. As a matter of fact, it can be that you don't even see it unless you have a microscope. Correct. All right. Uh, so small uh, that uh, you really need to look for it, usually either in the daylight, and then if you find something, you can look at it under a microscope. Um, yeah, we typically use um, you know our lab space as well as what we call oblique lighting with um, flashlights um, to see small, minute things. And when items, large items that have trace evidence on them are moved, that trace evidence can fall off. Correct. Right. So it's very important uh, that crime scenes, if they're to be examined by personnel of the crime laboratory, must be subject to as little traffic handling or disturbance as possible. As possible, yes. As possible, right. Okay. Now, um, you also supervise the taking of the swabs for DNA. Well, hold on, counsel. Uh, may I see you all sure. at sidebar? Thank you, Judge. So when we just and answered the last question, let me re-ask it. Um, so you supervise also the taking of swabs in the laboratory for DNA? I don't supervise that section. I work within that section. You work within that section. You Sometimes you take the swabs for an item that's going to be submitted to the DNA section. Correct. Okay. Now, um, since trace evidence is very small and DNA needs to be swabbed, you have to have, I assume, something to take them from, correct? I'm sorry, can you You have to have question? an item to take, to look for trace evidence, right? Um, either we have an item to look for trace evidence or we have trace evidence itself, um, you know, if it's left behind in a scene or something. Okay, and if you have um, DNA, you have to have an item to, to swab, right? You have to have an evidential item. Yes, in some cases. Okay, and I assume that if somebody, for instance, ran away from the scene, and took their clothes with them and burned them, you wouldn't be able to test those clothes for trace evidence? No. You have to have something to test. Correct. Okay. Now, when we were at the lab on October 4th, um, we looked at a lot of the evidence in this matter, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, you were kind enough and gracious enough to bring it out in boxes. We opened the boxes, we documented it, and then something happened when we were there, correct, in terms of looking at Mr. Furtado's shirt? No, not that I'm aware of. Well, when you took Mr. Furtado's shirt to evidence, and that's the shirt that's been marked before the jury as 242, remember, mounted, plaid shirt, red. Yeah, the plaid shirt, right. yes. Okay. Uh, when you took it into evidence, you did a report on taking it into evidence, correct? Oh, yes. Okay. And when, and when you put it in, you wrote a report, uh, I think you signed off on it, actually, I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, yes, you signed off on it as a supervisor of the letter of the letter. Uh, that uh, item 32, which is what your lab number was so that you could trace it. Yes. Which is now, in this courtroom, evidence number 242. Okay. 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 Uh, we had um, one red, blue, yellow, and white plaid button, college shirt, short sleeve shirt, correct? Correct. With Aero Postal, size MM, with a pocket <coughs> left front chest, correct? Correct. And the shirt appears worn with damage including a hole, hole number one, in the top right shoulder sleeve area measuring approximately one quarter of an inch in diameter, correct? Correct. And then it goes on to 
talk about being covered uh, with some blood, uh, reddish brown stains, and then you did a preliminary testing as you told the jury for blood, right? Yes. All right. You did not, that description then went into the evidence computer, or was it taken from the evidence computer? So there's that description filed out in 32 we all the way through in your lab. We don't have an evidence computer. You have an evidence log. Uh, evidence lock? Log, log. It's my New Jersey accent. Um, no, we don't have an evidence log. I don't. You track the evidence through a system? Yes. A computer system, correct? No, not in this case. Not in this case. So the, the report that you wrote on, let me get the exact date for you. 221 2014 described what you saw at that time correct okay and the reason why you document holes in, in a shooting case is because when somebody is wearing a, a item of evidence uh, the location of the shirt can be different than the bullet hole in the person and therefore you could possibly do a trajectory analysis I don't do trajectory analysis um, so I don't know what they could do with a hole in a shirt. Okay, but it's important to document everything you saw, correct? Yes, we document what we see. And, and sometimes forensic science is a collaborative effort. People can give you information that's important. Uh, you can work with other people that's important. Um, you're always open to new information, correct? Correct. Okay. And so when, the, um, when we were there and I was there with you on October 4th looking at that shirt, we noticed a second hole in that shirt, correct? Yes. Okay. And then um, you did a report, you took the shirt back out on October 5th, correct? Correct. And did a report documenting that there was a second hole? Correct, subsequently. Okay, so, um, so now we have that shirt with two holes. Correct. All right. Now those holes are visible in a photograph once you take the proper photograph of the shirt. Um, the hole number one, yes, was very visible. Um, hole number two is more like a tear, it's not a per se a hole like you would think um, with a diameter um, so it's not as visible. What was the diameter of, this, of the hole? Second there, hole. There wasn't a diameter. There was a, a measurement of okay. that hole. Okay, a measurement. The measurement was one half inch by one eighth inch. Correct. Okay. And you didn't do any um, testing around to see if there was GSR around that to see if that was a bullet wound or a bullet, a hole caused by a bullet, correct? Correct. I did not do any uh, distance determination testing. Okay. Because you already had an, an undershirt that had a hole in it in the back. No, his undershirt did not have a hole in the, the okay. back. All right. Um, with that shirt, after you documented it, uh, did anyone ask you to document that second hole or did you just do it because we found it when we were there? Yeah, uh, I observed you guys looking at it and you observed it, so I wanted to document okay. it. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that because, again, forensic science is a collaborative effort, right? Correct. Sometimes people see something that somebody else doesn't see, and it's important to take that into consideration at all times. Correct. Okay. Now, I think, uh, let me ask you this question. This is a good example also of how easy it is to miss something that's a trace evidence. Um, it is easy to miss trace evidence because it is so small, um, but when we are asked to uh, examine something for trace evidence, then I would look a lot um, more detailed uh, examination. Okay, so your testimony is you weren't asked to examine any of these doc items that you testified to yesterday that you mounted the shirts and all for trace evidence. Correct. Okay. So when you did the testing for presumptive blood and you found it was presumptively blood, Correct. Makes sense because it was a shooting case. Correct. Correct. All right. You didn't do anything else with those items. No. So when you looked at those items, they don't have any evidential value in terms of the trace area. Um, no, not not in this case. <clears throat> okay. And so um, anything this jury can glean can, can about those items can be gleaned from the pictures because there's nothing trace evidence that was on those pictures. Right. It was on those Street original. Pictures. In that form. Okay. There's nothing on the big mounting of the shirt that's brought into courtroom here that would add anything to your evaluation of trace evidence. It wouldn't add anything um, probatively to the case. Okay. All right. Now, you also swabbed the gun for DNA. Correct. Okay. And that was on 2-27-15? Um, I would have to look at my notes. Please okay. do.
Yes. Okay. And then after you swab the gun in the areas you told us about, you sent it off to uh, Leighton Print, and then that's when Ms. Uh, Tolan got it. Correct. Okay. And you did that because uh, you swabbed first because you didn't want the taking of fingerprints to remove any DNA. I didn't want, um, typically what we do is we, we like to process it for DNA first, and then it goes for fingerprints, and then it goes for firearms. Because DNA can be very minuscule on an item, correct? Yes, it can be. Okay. As a matter of fact, the sample that you had of this swab was consumed into the testing, correct? Correct. That is our procedure. And when you even get, uh, DNA is found in every single cell in the body except for the red blood cell? It is found in the white blood cells in your body. Okay. It is found in your skin cells? It can cells? be, um, unless there are no white blood cells in those, in those skin cells. It can be found in your sweat? It can be, unless there are no white blood cells in there. It can be found in your saliva? Yes. It just can't be found in the red blood cell, despite what everyone sees on TV? Correct. Okay. All right. So, uh, when you swab for DNA, you can get DNA that's the size of a pinhead, correct? I'm not a DNA expert, so um, I don't really know what the size is for okay. a, a DNA sample. You just know from trace evidence that it could be very small? It can be, yes. Okay. All right. So, then the prints went to... Um, Ms. Tolan, and at that time you did not know whether or not the prints that had the, the friction ridge detail, the partial prints that had been found by uh, Detective Lord of the State Police, whether or not they were still there or not. Uh, that assumes this witness knows. Well, you saw, you saw uh, evidence, a greenish yellow staining on the gun. Correct. And as a matter of fact, you wrote a report that said there was previous evidence of fingerprinting on the gun. It appeared that there was possible um, previous chemical processing, correct? Okay. So at the time that you swabbed for DNA, you did not know whether or not that friction ridge detail somehow had been removed or was still there? I don't know if there was any friction ridge detail on the, the weapon okay. at the time. All right. But you were careful to make sure that if it was still there, that you didn't, didn't interfere with it? Correct. We always uh, swab the textured areas. Okay. Now. Um, you also have uh, given us your, uh, through your statement of qualifications for, the, from, for accreditation with ASCLAD, all the courses that you've taken over the years. Yes. Right? And, and it's important to keep up with uh, forensic science over the years because it's a quickly changing technology. Yeah, some of the disciplines are very quick. Okay. And you've taken an advanced crime scene investigation by Henry C. Lee Institute? Yes, a, a while back. Okay, that would be in, let's see. Uh, 2003? Correct. And uh, you understand that you believe that Henry Lee is uh, a top flight criminalist? Um, it w actually wasn't taught by Henry Lee. Um, it was taught at his institute. Okay. Uh, but you learned that as incidents cer certain things concerning trace evidence, like you can get trace evidence off glass, right? Um, I don't... Uh, well, trace evidence is a piece of... A glass is a piece of trace evidence. Okay. So a piece of glass is a, is a piece of trace evidence, and if you have thousands of pieces of glass, those are thousands of pieces of trace evidence. Correct. And you also know, as a criminalist dealing with trace evidence, that if glass is fractured in a car, in an automobile, it can uh, break apart. It. If that's your understanding based on your training and experience, you may answer. It depends on the type of that uh, you're talking about. Okay. And safety glass that breaks apart is called dicing? Uh, it's called tempered glass, yes, and it dices when it uh, breaks, basically when it's broken. Okay, and all those little pieces of glass are different pieces of trace evidence, correct? Yes. So if you look at, you won't know unless you look at the glass, for instance, whether or not there is a piece of a copper jacket that's embedded in the glass. Uh, sustained lay a foundation. Okay. Now you know that trace evidence can actually come in the glass, can be included as part of the glass if there's a shot. If you know that to be the case, you may answer it or explain your answer. I mean, a piece of glass is trace evidence to us, so I, 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 I don't understand kind of what you're asking. Okay. All right. Um, you didn't come to the scene of the shooting on July 16, 
2012, did you? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, therefore, you weren't able to recommend to anyone whether or not uh, the crime scene people at that scene should pick up the glass that was diced from the shooting. That was on the ground? That was on the ground. I was not asked to do that, no. You were not asked to do that. Do you know or were you ever taught whether or not there was forensic value in doing that? Um, to me, as a trace evidence person, there's no uh, value in that. Um, so you've never been asked to reconstruct a window of a glass that's been shot out at to determine what shots come first? I have been asked to reconstruct um, glass, not safety glass or not tempered glass, what we call tempered glass. So it's a daunting task, would you not agree? It's a daunting task as well as you probably aren't going to get it correct because well, it's, okay, you know, the, the cubes dice for a reason um, and you can't really put them back together uh, that well <laughs> um, because they're all basically the same size, um, shape, and everything. So, you know, it's not, it's not typically like a puzzle piece. So you would disagree with any statement that it's possible to reassemble the dice glass and determine which bullet hit the dice glass first? You disagree with that? It's not that it's not possible. It's, it's a very daunting task. Um, if you had a piece that had a partial bullet hole in it, you might be able to tell something from that. But um, we wouldn't, in the crime lab, put that whole tempered piece of glass back together again. Okay. But you know it can be done. I've never heard of anybody doing that. Were you ever taught that from the Henry Lee Institute? To put a whole piece of tempered glass back together? Yes. No. Were you ever taught that you can actually determine a broken glass of the crime scene can determine a fracture pattern? Yes, you can determine a fracture pattern in certain uh, types of glass. And when we talk about a fracture pattern, we're talking about which, it can be, which bullet hits the glass first? Yes, which bullet hits the glass first. And if there are more than one bullet that hits the glass, you can determine from a fracture pattern. Um, that's typically done in laminated glass, um, not done in tempered glass, but um, that's just my experience. All right. Were you aware that a car, are you aware that a car window is laminated glass, three sets of lamination? The window, windshield is okay. laminated glass. All right. And the sides, you're saying it was tempered glass? Correct. Okay. And um, you're aware, however, that you still can put together a window in tempered glass? Like I said, I've never done it before. I wouldn't attempt to do it myself, um, but uh, I'm assuming that it is possible. Okay. If it was important to determine how many bullets hit a window, would you recommend it? Um, no, overruled. Um, typically, when you have tempered glass, the first uh, bullet strike, whatever it is that breaks it, um, shatters it. So um, you probably aren't going to have a possibility of having a second hole or anything. All right. So your determination, even if you had been there, was that picking up the glass would not have helped. Is that what you're telling this jury? To me, uh, for glass analysis, it's not probative in that case. Well, would preservation of the glass in the window that had not been broken completely be important? Let's assume part of the glass was, was taken out of the window by a shot yep. and a whole bunch of the glass remained in the window. Yes, that could possibly be kept uh, in, the win in the window. All right. And then you could determine if you kept that glass intact that way if there was a bullet hole in it or a bullet strike in it. If there was, yes. Okay. But if you don't have any glass, no matter what, you can't do any of this. Correct. Now. You also testified to being at the Toyota um, when the uh, evidence, the crime scene unit, your, the crime lab unit was there on July 1st, 2013. Correct. Right? And uh, you're aware the Toyota was taken into custody about four days before, correct? I don't know the actual date. Okay. So you were just called and, and a whole team from the crime lab came down to the forensic bank. Correct. Right? Okay. And one of the people was Kevin Kosorek. Yes. And Mr. Kishorek, um, is he still at the lab, by the way? Yes. Okay. Mr. Kishorek was the one who uh, took what's called SEM stubs. 
Correct. He was the one that stubbed the uh, Toyota 4Runner. Okay. And SEM stubs uh, are to determine whether there's gunshot residue in the car. Gunshot primer residue, yes. Gunshot primer residue. And primer residue is what? Made up of what? Uh, it's the primer of the bullet, and it, it's made up of typically um, lead, barium, and antimony okay. uh, chemicals. All right. And you said that, uh, and he took those stubs and did that, that little swabbing with that little... SEM stub at 352 through 354, correct? I'd have to look at my Okay, times. please. Yes, uh, 353 was for the front driver's side, um, and 354 was for the back um, driver's side, sorry. Okay, now when you say front driver's side, Headliner and windowsill, right? Correct. What's the headliner? The headliner is the um, either the fabric or the plastic that is above the window, um, above, you know, above your head, basically. Above your head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to clear that up, it's, you're not talking about the thing that you pull down to keep the sun out of your eyes. Not the sun visor. Correct. Okay. You're talking about above each of the heads, right? Correct. And he took one from the top of the head of the driver's side. Uh. Yes. Right? The top of the head of the passenger side? Uh, in my notes it says actually back passenger, uh, back driver's side, sorry. Back driver's side, where was that? Uh, the back, well it would be the passenger, you know, the back passenger. Okay, so he took the stubs from the front passenger side. So the front driver's side and the back driver's side. And the back driver's side, and then he took the passenger front passenger side seat no, that was a hair that was collected from the front passenger side. Okay, that was a hair that was collected. Correct. We're going to get to that. Okay, so I just wanted to clear up exactly where the SEM stuff was. So above the driver's head. Correct. Above the back seat passenger's head. Yeah, behind the driver. Back seat passenger's head. Okay. And uh, do you know the results of that? No. Okay. You were just there when this was taken. Correct. Okay. And then um, what time did you get there, by the way? Your group. We arrived at 2 p.m. Okay. I'm sorry, 3.05 p.m. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, 3.05 p.m. And before Mr. Koshorek took the uh, GSR stubs, the, or what's called the SEM stubs, to look for GSR, what was done by your group? Um, typically, we examine the vehicle. Uh, we note any damage, maybe if there's any damage on the outside of the vehicle or damage on the inside of the vehicle. And then we uh, look at the areas where we are asked to examine with typically a flashlight. Um, and I talked about that before with the oblique lighting. Um, it's kind of the side lighting um, to potentially see anything, any trace evidence. Okay. All right. And then what was done next after you looked at the light? This SEM stubs? Yeah, we collected the hair first, um, and then we did the SEM stubs. Okay. When was DNA taken from the car? None. No, no DNA was taken from the car. There was no DNA taken from the steering wheel? Correct. No DNA taken from uh, the seat adjustment area? No. Uh, no DNA taken from the key fob that was in the car? No. Okay. And the key fob was in the car, correct? I don't even know. All right, let me see if we can mark these. <coughs> I'm sorry? You want to mark this one separately? Well, I want what marked? The photos, three photos. Why don't we have them identified? Okay. Let me show you a photo that we have not yet marked for identification, okay? Uh, is that an accurate and fair representation of the car as you saw it on July 1st, 2012? Um, it, it is without the fingerprint powder. Okay, you were not there for the fingerprint Correct. powder. Correct. Okay. And is that an accurate and fair representation of the car as you saw it on July, uh, I'm sorry, on July 1st, 2013 without the fingerprint powder? Yes. Okay. And um, when you saw the car on July 1st, 2013, was this can of shell zone, this red cloth, or these paper 
foot protectors in? Not that I'm aware of. I don't, I don't recall. You don't recall? Okay. And I have two of these that I'm walking on. Uh, these are four runner? Correct. Any objection? Why don't we receive them as 247A and B? Let me see if I have better luck with this today. I'm going to show you what's been marked 247A. Okay. Um, aside from what, apparently what I put on there, which is that fuchsia marking, uh, can we just adjust this a little bit? Focus this. I'm going to focus from there. It doesn't want to focus for me either. Thank you for all your help. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked 247. Hold on, if you would, just one second. Sure. <laughs> My file is too big. See if we can right. start this again. Thank Appreciate you, Jay. Thank Please. you, Lisa. All right, so I'm just showing what's been marked 247A. Uh, and that's the fair representation of the car as you saw it on July 1st, 2013, uh, but without the fingerprint powder. Correct. Okay. And you know from um, your um, working in the trace lab, the fingerprint powder makes quite a mess. Yes. And uh, it does show that the key is here in the car. You see that? Yes. Okay. Now, again, that was never tested for DNA, correct? Correct. Now, uh, finger fingerprints, as you mentioned, um, or as has been mentioned in this courtroom, are chance impressions, correct? I, again, I'm not a... If you know. <coughs> if you know. I'm not a fingerprint expert. Okay. But you know that DNA is considered the gold standard of forensic science, correct? Is that a phrase you're familiar with and you accept? Um, I've heard it before. Well, you know that you can get DNA off of a person off little tiny bits, right? Again, I'm not a, a DNA expert, so I don't know the size, um, the least amount that you can get it from. Okay. Well, as a trace evidence expert, when you um, swab an item, you're looking for people's DNA, correct? When we swab an item for uh, DNA, yes, that is what we are looking for. And um, you would expect, obviously, to find Aaron Hernandez's DNA in his car, correct? No. You wouldn't expect to find it? No. Okay. Um, would, if you found somebody else's DNA in Aaron Hernandez's car, would that be important? No, we don't expect uh, anything in the forensic science field. But when you swab, you're looking for something. You're not swabbing out of the blue. We're swabbing for possible DNA. OK. Correct. And you're swabbing to see whose DNA profile may be on a piece of, of uh, evidence, correct? If it's there, yes. All right. And the reason you do that is because you can identify uh, different avenues to pursue if you know whose DNA is there. 
Um, I guess I don't understand what you mean by avenues. Well, if you swab the steering wheel, it may lead you to who drove the car, correct? Um, it may lead you to who left their DNA there. Right. And who left the DNA there because you do DNA testing and swabbing, you know is an important avenue and trace evidence. Um, it, as again I said before, it may tell you who left their DNA there. Um, it, it's not, it's not going to tell you if they drove the vehicle last or, or anything like that. But you don't know any of those issues if you don't take the DNA in the first place? Correct. Okay. And no DNA was taken out of this car anywhere in this car? Correct. Okay. Uh, and no DNA was taken from the key, correct? Correct. We talked about that. All right. So you did do um, the fingerprint powder, right? You did authorize that to be done. I have had gone left at that point, so that's not my authorization. Okay. Well, let me just show you this picture, which you have identified. Let's see if I have better luck here. Turn it. 247B. Uh, is that a fair and accurate representation of how you sold the car uh, prior to the fingerprint powder? Correct. Okay. Uh, did you see anything besides that uh, blue case in the car in the back seat? I don't recall. Um, now, as we just discussed, fingerprint powder creates quite a mess, correct? Yes. Okay. And you've seen fingerprint powder before from working in the lab, right? Yes. Okay. And then somehow you have to get the fingerprint powder off the car. I don't know what they do with it, the car afterwards. Well, you don't put fingerprint powder on a car like this if you're going to swap for DNA, right? If we're going to swab for DNA, it can be done prior to or after uh, fingerprint powder testing. It's just preferable to do it beforehand. Okay. And why is it preferable? Um, because the fingerprint powder um, not only can uh, damage DNA, but also the feather dusters that they use, or if that's the correct term, the dusters that they use um, can actually transfer DNA from one area to another area. Okay. And transfer of DNA is done how? Uh, it picks it up on that duster and it deposits it on another area. And DNA is very sensitive, correct? Yes. Okay. Now you also collected a hair in the car, right? Correct. Excuse me one second, Your Honor. And that hair was a blonde hair you testified to? It was a blonde hair fragment, yes. A blonde hair fragment. Three centimeters? Three centimeters uh, in length, correct. Uh, and that's a, what, a little over an inch? Yes. Ms. Reynolds, is this a fair and accurate representation of the hair fragment that you collected? Yes. Your Honor, may I have this marked? The exhibit 258. I'm showing you what's been marked, exhibit 248. Um, that's the hair fragment you collected from the passenger seat of the Toyota on July 1st, 2013. The front passenger seat, yes. Right. Now, you told us yesterday that you could not uh, identify what species this hair fragment came from. Correct. Okay. Now, hair is different from fur from a dog, correct? Um, we consider fur to be hair as well in the forensic science field. Okay. And even though you don't have the root on this hair, you can do something called mitochondrial DNA testing, correct? That is a possibility if it was a human hair, correct? Right. Well, you don't know whether it's human or not, correct? Correct. And as a matter of fact, if you did mitochondrial DNA, you would determine whether or not it was human or not. Absolutely. Uh, is that something you do, Ms. Reynolds? No. Do you authorize it being done in your lab? Uh, Yes, we do send it out for mitochondrial DNA testing if uh, asked. Okay. 
And uh, you are aware, because you are uh, running the trace evidence lab, that you can get DNA, a different type of DNA, called mitochondrial DNA, from a hair fragment. It is possible, yes. Okay. And you can determine from a hair fragment uh, if you get a profile back on the mitochondrial DNA and have someone to match it to, who this hair may belong to. It's not uh, who this hair may belong to, it's um, a maternal line of people. Okay. So you can determine a maternal line, correct? Correct. And you certainly can determine if you had uh, a person that you wanted to compare this hair against, whether it came from a maternal line, either both male or female. Correct. All right. And uh, if you knew also uh, that, uh, for instance, um, anybody in this case had a blonde hair, that would be of interest to you, would you not? Sure. Well, let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase it. You didn't do anything further with this hair, correct? Correct. No one asked you to do anything further with this hair, correct? Correct. No one asked you, for instance, uh, whether or not a um, female friend of a witness had blonde hair, correct? Sure. Uh, no one asked you uh, to, that no one asked you whether or not there was a witness who may have blonde hair in this case. Would you know? I know nothing about a person that has blonde hair in this case. Okay. So no one came to you, no detective came to you and said, um, we have a family member of somebody who may have been in this car, and we want to determine whether this family member who has blonde hair, whether this is her blonde hair? No one. Overruled. No one came to me and asked me that, no. And did you look to see whether or not this hair had been processed to be bleached? Uh, as I'm uh, examining it, if I noted that in my uh, notes, it would be in my report. Okay. So you didn't notice any processing on this hair? I did not. And in fact, when you say it's blonde, uh, did you determine whether it was, it's uh, bright platinum blonde? Did you determine whether it was brown blonde? What did you determine? The color uh, blonde is a, like a yellowish color to me. Um, so that to me is not uh, indicative of um, dying. If I, like I said, if I'd seen a dying characteristic, I would have noted that. Okay. But in any event, no one came to you and said, look, we have a member, we have a witness who may have a family member or a close relative or a girlfriend who has blonde hair, please test it. No. questions on this hair. Um, you didn't note that was bleached on your report, correct? Is that what you just said? Correct. But you also didn't note the second hole in Mr. Furtado's shirt in the back of his shirt, correct? Correct. I didn't observe that. Okay. So sometimes things can be missed unless you go take a closer look, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. I'm on. John Biello. Commonwealth and the defendant at the bar shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help you, God. I do. Thank you. Watch your step. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Would you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and spell your last name for the record? John Biello, B 
B-I-E-L-L-O. Mr. Biello, what is your current occupation? I'm a forensic scientist three uh, at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory. How long have you worked at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory? Uh, in May will be 17 years. And if you could, um, starting with your, your educational background, Mr. Biello, where did you graduate from college? I graduated uh, from Stonehill College with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry degree. And following your graduation with a bachelor's in chemistry, what was your first um, chemistry-related job out of college? Uh, I worked as an analytical chemist at Merchandise Testing Labs. What type of work did you do there? Um, there we tested uh, for lead paint in children's toys. Um, we compared the generic over-the-counter medication with name brand medic medication, made sure things uh, complied with FDA regulations. Now, calling your attention to what you've described about 17 years ago when you joined the Massachusetts State Police in some capacity, the year 2000, um, what was your first job with Massachusetts State Police? Um, the Drug Identification Unit and also with the Crime Scene Response Unit. And just to clarify, Mr. Biello, are you a sworn trooper or a civilian employee? I'm a civilian employee. A civilian employee scientist? Correct. Um, calling your attention to the work you did in the Drug Identification Unit in 2000 until you departed in around 2005, what type of work did you do in that unit? Uh, we looked uh, for the presence or non-presence of controlled substances. And at some point in your capacity there, were you promoted from Forensic Scientist to another title? Um, when I left the Drug Identification Unit, I moved into the um, Arson and Explosives Unit in 2005. Uh, from there, in 2014, I was promoted to the supervisor of the arson and explosives unit. So you supervise a number of employees in the arsons and explosives, arson and explosives unit? Yes. How many uh, scientists do you uh, supervise, sir? Uh, three. Would you describe, if you would, sir, what the arson and explosives unit does at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory? Yes. In that unit, we look for the presence of any accelerants in fire cases, uh, any explosive residues in explosive cases and then also gunshot primer residue uh, in gun-related cases. Now, Mr. Biel, in addition to your chemistry degree and the experience you've already talked about um, being a chemist both in a private uh, facility as well as the Massachusetts State Police, can you describe what type of particular training you've had in the area of explosives, arson, uh, firearms? Um, yes. With each of the disciplines, uh, you first read literature in each of those subject matter. You observe a senior chemist uh, performing casework in those disciplines. Uh, you do a, a few practical type casework um, to practice. Then you perform a competency test and then we also do proficiency tests. From there we also attend any outside training through other agencies such as the ATF or the FBI and any of the manufacturers of our equipment that we use. And your unit itself, the Trace Arson and Explosives Unit of the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory, is that what they refer to as ASCLAD accredited? Yes. And as the ASCLAD accredited uh, uh, laboratory, as part of that, you've indicated, I believe, in your testimony that you do have to undergo some proficiency testing. Is that correct? Yes. And in the course of your time, not only as a supervisor, but also as a forensic scientist with that unit, the firearms or, or Trace Arson and Explosives Unit, have you successfully completed all of your proficiency tests? Yes. Are you a member of any particular um, associations that are relevant uh, to the forensic sciences, sir? Yes, I'm a member of the American Society of Trace Evidence Examiners and also the Northeastern Association of Forensic Scientists. And then just in case our math isn't very good, sir, so how many years total have you been working um, at the Trace Arson Explosives Unit? So since 2005, so 12 years in May. Now, sir, call your attention in particular to something that's, uh, well, let me back up for one moment. Have you had the opportunity to provide what's often called opinion or expert testimony in any courts in the Commonwealth? Yes. Uh, in what courts and in what areas? Um, all across the Commonwealth here, um, Plymouth County, um, Cape and the Islands, uh, out in Springfield, also federal court in Worcester approximately testified over a hundred times. Mr. Biel, I want to call your attention to um, your training and experience and knowledge as to what happens when a firearm, when a gun is fired. Um, do you have experience in uh, testing certain items uh, for the presence of what's called gunshot primer residue? Yes. Mr. Biel, as we talk about this, if you had an opportunity to see some slides from a PowerPoint that would assist in explaining this, this uh, to the jury? 
Yes. May I approach witness Brock? You may. <coughs> I'm going to show you just three pages um, that appear to be slides from a, a PowerPoint. Just ask you if you recognize the um, depictions on the three photograph or three pages. Uh, yes. And are those um, fair and accurate representations that will assist a jury in understanding the science or the um, processing behind uh, determining gunshot residue? Um, yes. You don't have to ask that this be marked for identification only. That's John. Three pages. <coughs> Nancy, we're up to W U U. -U. -U, -U. <coughs> Mr. Beal, I'm placing on the screen um, what's been identified as U U. Bill, can you just describe a few words for the jurors um, what happens when a gun is discharged, a gun is fired, relative to the release of certain particles? Um, okay, in the back of the ammunition in the primer cup is where the primer residue is held. So when the firing pin hits the primer cup, it's going to create an initial explosion which ignites the propellant which will eject the bullet. So you have a, with the explosion, you have a release of gas out of all the openings of the weapon, the front, the sides, the rear. So when that gas hits the air, air it's going to quickly start to cool and start to form tiny microscopic particles that get distributed around the weapon. Uh, when you have a particle that is comprised of lead, antimony, and barium and has the correct shape or morphology, that's a gunshot primer residue. So this picture here just the, depicts the um, gas cloud that is released from the weapon when it's fired. So the way to determine whether or not um, an object or, or a person or uh, something was near a weapon when it was fired, you're looking for the presence of certain um, substances, compounds, or elements. Is that correct? Correct. The uh, primer is comprised of uh, lead stiffnate, antimony sulfide, and barium nitrate. So when those explode and you have the combination of the lead, barium, and antimony coming together in one particle, that's a gunshot primer residue particle. Mr. Beale, I've placed page two of what's been marked as UU for identification on the screen. Um, you've just talked about this, but tell us what we see, uh, in particular the photograph that we see here. Um, that depicts a um, picture of the shape or morphology of a gunshot primer residue particle. They tend to be rounded in nature, but they can also be irregular shaped as well. Mr. Beale, calling your attention to gunshot res primer residue itself, as you've described it, which it seems to be the combination of those three elements, lead, barium, and antimony, can you discuss at all um, how uh, durable that is? In other words, is, is that easily removed or is it, does it stay on a surface for a long time? Um, they're very durable particles, so <laughs> unless in uh, outside type force, whether it's friction, whether it's water or solvents or wiping down, those particles will remain unless there's an uh, outside force applied to them. So when you say outside force, are they easily re removed or are they difficult to remove? Uh, they're very easy to remove because they are microscopic. They only range from a half a micron up to a hundred microns. So they're very tiny, so any kind of friction rubbing, they can fall off from one item to another. Now, Mr. Beale, in your, in your experience, have you had the opportunity to test people's hands for what is called gunshot residue primer, as you've discussed. Yes. And what is meant by the four hour rule? Can you explain what that means? Uh, with the hands, after four hours, you tend not to be able to recover GSR from the hands. Um, that was done with our own in-house study to determine that rule just for the hands. And just so we're making sure we're talking about the same thing, when you say GSR, is that a term for gunshot residue? Yes, we, we shorten it down for the primer residue just as GSR. And that's the same as what we're talking about, gunshot primer residue, same thing? Correct. And, and calling your attention now to whether or not you've indicated that sometimes 
uh, after a certain period of time, gunshot residue will not remain on the hands, either, even on somebody who's fired a weapon. Do you have any statistical studies relative to persons who have committed suicide with a firearm and what percentage you will find gunshot residue on their hands? Um, yes, studies have shown uh, victims of known suicide by a weapon. <laughs> 70 to 80 percent come back positive, 20 to 30 percent remain negative. And so I think you've already talked about this, but are there certain environmental factors that would affect whether or not gunshot residue would still remain on a surface, whether it be uh, clothing or car or that type, type of thing? Um, yes, as I said, as time goes by, it diminishes your chances of recovering. But any kind of applying any kind of water or solvents can remove those particles. Any kind of uh, wiping can remove those particles. Uh, if it's windy, uh, particles may not even land on the area around the weapon. Um, you can't quantify how much is produced when the weapon's fired. And then actually where they're going to land once they come out of the weapon. Generally they fall one to three feet, but they can travel up to nine feet in distance. And your opinion as to if, an, uh, if a surface is clean that may have had gunshot residue, primer, gunshot primer residue on it, would the cleaning of that surface, in your opinion, have removed the particles? Um, it can, yes. Mr. Biel, I'd like you to discuss, if you would, the process um, behind uh, when you get uh, an item of evidence and how you process it and test it for the president, presence of gunshot residue. First, what is meant by a, a SEM stub? What is that? So that's the collection stub. Um, it's about the size, if you picture, the size of a dime head, and it has a sticky um, carbon surface on top. So that area is what is applied to the area of interest, whether it's hands or vehicle or clothing. So those stubs are what is submitted to us for analysis. And once that stub is submitted, and you don't have to get too, too technical on us, but what, explain the process of testing of those stubs and what you're looking for to make a determination. <laughs> Okay. So first thing, I would take those stubs out of the evidence and put them into my custody and I'll start to do my exam with them. First thing we do is uh, place a thin layer of carbon on top of those uh, stubs. That's just to reduce any charging effects that may occur and also to make the material conductive. Um, once I do that, those stubs along with a positive control and a negative control are placed into our scanning electron microscope, which also has energy dispersive spectroscopy attached to it. So in what it will do is the instrument will analyze all the area of the stub and it will basically take pictures of any particles that are bright or emitting light. It will capture an image of that particle and then also analyze its elemental composition to see what that particle is comprised of. So it's an, all, it's an automated system. Once it is finished and complete, I'll sit down at the instrument and I will review all the particles and determine if they have the correct morphology or shape with the correct elemental composition to determine if they're gunshot primer residue particles or not. And how long does that process typically take? Uh, typically, it can take as little as about uh, if you have two unknown stubs with the positive negative control, it can take as little as four hours and it can take up to sometimes 48 hours just to run, depending on how much debris or uh, particles are on that sample stub. Mr. Biel, I've placed on the screen page three of what's been marked as uh, UU. Is this an example of a, of a positive result uh, for gunshot residue? Um, yes, this is a um, picture indicating uh, the particle is in the top left corner with the crosshead, yes, that rounded um, particle, and then down below is its elemental composition of what that particle is made up of. So you see that the lead is depicted by the PB, and the antimony is depicted by the SB, and the barium is depicted by the BA. So here we can see the shape of the particle with its elemental composition. That would be a gunshot primer residue particle. And does it require the presence of all three of those elements, the lead, the barium, and the antimony? Yes. And in addition to finding one particle, as we see here on page three of exhibit <coughs> UU, um, what's required for a positive determination by you 
as a forensic scientist for the presence of gunshot residue primer? Is it just one particle or more? So we need to find three individual particles, each containing those three elements, in order to have a positive result. So if only one is found, that's a, non that's a negative result? Correct. Uh, two would also be a negative? Correct. And when you say positive result, what, how do you report your findings? What does a positive result mean um, relative to what you can determine as a forensic scientist? So if we're talking about the hands, a positive result would indicate that a person may have fired a firearm, uh, may have been in the vicinity of a firearm that was discharged, or may have come into contact with another item that had gunshot primer residue on it, so from transfer. And relative to a finding of negative for the presence of, of gunshot residue, which would include one particle, two particles, or no particles, what does that finding mean from the perspective of, of you reporting out the uh, scientific result? Um, we don't draw any conclusions from the negative, except that whatever the stubs that were submitted, that those were negative for gunshot primer residue. And does that indicate, in your opinion, based upon your training experience, that the items submitted were not in the presence of a, of a weapon that was fired, or can you make that conclusion? You can't make that conclusion. So there are situations that you're aware of where uh, an item was close to a weapon that was fired but um, had no results negative for gunshot residue? That's possible, yes. And as you talked about, there are a number of factors that are involved in whether or not gunshot primer residue will stay on the surface. Is that correct? Correct. And cleaning was one of those factors? That can remove the particles, yes. Mr. Beal, I'm going to call your attention now that you've talked about the process of science. Call your attention to the work you did on this particular case that's um, in court here today. Call your attention now to July 8th, the year 2013. Were two items submitted to you from Detective Paul McIsaac of the Boston Police Department Homicide Unit for testing by your unit? Yes. I'm calling your attention now to your item 1-1 and item 1-2. Um, were those submitted and received by you, sir? Uh, yes, they were submitted to our evidence control unit. And ultimately, was that forwarded to you for processing? Yes. What were those two items, if you recall? Um, the two items, one was labeled coming from the front driver's side headliner and windowsill. Is that item 1-1? One -one? Uh, yes. And 1-2 was from the back rear um, head, uh, driver's side headliner and windowsill. And did you process both of those items in the manner in which you've just described to the jurors um, as far as putting, uh, putting the carbon coating on it and then putting it into the electron microscope for processing? Yes. And what was the result of your testing of those two items, sir? That they were negative for gunshot primer residue. And in addition to being negative for gunshot primer residue, um, does your conclusion then go on uh, to say anything else relative uh, to the negative result? Yes. What is that, sir? Uh, it says that we don't draw any conclusion as to whether this item may have been in the vicinity of a fired weapon or may have come into contact with another item that had GSR on it. And generally speaking, uh, Mr. Biello, do you have any statistics as to, um, of all the items that are submitted to your laboratory or your unit, I should say, um, how many ultimately test positive for gun sh the presence of gunshot residue, percentage-wise? Uh, yes, all the cases, about 20 to 25 percent come back positive for gunshot primer residue. Thank you very much, Mr. Bialio. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> good, day. good morning, Mr. Biello. Good morning. You were here yesterday. I saw you in the hallway. Yes, finally got on. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I'd like to focus on this UU uh, that you showed as a demonstrative exhibit to the jury as how uh, a revolver, and this is a revolver in both of these pictures, correct? Um, that's correct. Okay. Uh, a semi-automatic weapon has GSR coming out of it in a different way, correct? Um, in a semi-automatic, it's more closed, but it will still escape from all the areas of the weapon, the front and the side. And in a revolver, though, you get it from the back of the uh, gun, correct? 
Yes. Uh, you get it from the sides, the barrel, correct? Correct. And you get it from the front, because that's where the, the strongest propulsion of the bullet comes out, right? Correct. And I see this, this um, right here, is all these lines. What is that? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure as far as what those lines are. Okay. It might just be depicting the initial well, explosion that occurs. All right. Uh, you shoot guns, right? As it, have you ever shot a gun? Uh, I've only shot a gun actually three times. Okay. Do you know anything about muzzle flash? Um, no. Okay. So you don't know what that is. You don't know if that's hot there, correct? Correct. And your work with GSR, do you know whether or not the GSR particles, when they come out of the gun from the back, from the front, from the sides, whether or not they're hot, hot due to the propulsion of the uh, bullet through the weapon? They do escape under very high temperature and pressure, yes. And in fact, you've had cases where a GSR particle can burn something that's fabric, correct? I'm not sure I've come across that for a, G, for okay. a primer residue part. For pri you, have, you haven't come across that yourself for primer residue? No. But you do know that there's a certain distance that the GSR particles can travel, correct? Correct. Now, did anyone ever come to you and say, uh, the gun that is in evidence in this case, um, <coughs> that was previously marked, which the jurors have seen, uh, that we did testing on that gun and we can determine how far the particles come out from that gun? No. Right, so you have the generic idea that the particles can travel one to three feet generally. Correct. And then under certain extreme circumstances can go to nine feet, correct? Correct. Wind pushing the particles, right? That can be a factor, okay. yes. Okay. Um, uh, high rate of speed pushing the particles. Yes. Huge, uh, a huge uh, grain bullet pushing the particles. That could play a factor, okay. yes. But you don't know in this gun how far they go. Well, as I stated, generally they fall one to three feet, can and, travel up to nine feet. And that's because they're very, very tiny, right? Correct. They don't have much mass to them. They don't have much weight to them, correct? Correct. Okay, so uh, if I am in the driver's <coughs> side of the seat, right, I'm driving the car, all right, and I put my whole arm out of a car and then have a gun extended, the muzzle of that gun is more than one foot out of the car, correct? Yes. And it could is more than two feet. Correct. And three feet. Possibly yes. Right. And um, I'm I'm five six, so five seven. I try five seven on my license. I lie a little bit. All right. Um, on that. So uh, indeed, if somebody has their full arm extended out of the car, and there is a gunshot from that gun the GSR particles may never ever reach the car. That's possible, yes. Right. So when you have a negative finding of gunshot residue in a car, you can't tell whether it's because it's been wiped, correct? Correct. Or whether somebody's arm was outside of the car and the, car and the gun was shot. Correct. You can't make that determination. Correct. Okay. Now, um, is bullet wipe different from GSR? Um, for the primer residue, yes. yes. Okay, what is bullet wipe? Um, I believe that testing has to do around the, the bullet, the hole uh, from the bullet. It's okay. different testing. It's different testing. And that's different than finding the primer residue, which is inside the bullet itself. Which is inside the primer cavity. It's inside Correct. the primer cavity to make that gun, that bullet, propel out of the gun. Right? Correct. All right. So then we already determined that you can't make a determination whether somebody's arm was completely outside a car from shooting. Okay. Um, <coughs> And you already said that GSR uh, can be wiped away. Yes. And it's also very fragile. It can go away. Um, it like just, the particles are durable, but they can move very they, easily. Very, very easily. And also, they can move inside a car. And you know about studies where uh, police officers have actually uh, transferred GSR into a car or into a cell because they carry weapons, right? Um, there's been studies that have shown that that is possible, yes. So you have to really do this examination early on to have any evidentiary value, no matter what, correct? Um, the faster you can get to it, the better, yes. Because if anybody who's carried a gun has gone into the car since, they could transfer a GSR particle with them. They can, yes. Okay. 
So the, let me, if we can just summarize so that it's better to do it faster. Sooner. Sooner. Thank you. Better to do it sooner. Correct, because the more time that goes by, the chances to finding it diminish. Okay. Yes. And that they're very small particles. But, yes. You can't see them. Yes. All right. And that you can't make a determination but by a negative finding whether or not something has been wiped or whether or not somebody's arm was outside a car and the GSR never got in the car in the first place. Correct. Excuse me, Your Honor, just one second. Now, if you had a gun that shot inside a car, right, um, how many particles would be discharged from that gun? You can't quantify how much is produced when the gun's fired. So, like I said, when it hits the air and starts to cool and form these particles, it may just form a few of those three component particles. It may form, you know, a whole bunch. You just, you don't know how many it's going to produce. It may just produce you know, just barium and antimony coming together, which isn't a gunshot primer residue particle. And again, us. because you never had specific testing from this gun to determine how many GSR particles were, were shot, you can't draw any conclusion then if the particles would have, a lot of particles would have fallen inside the car. You can't determine, quantify from any gun, not just because it's in the back of the ammunition. It doesn't matter the gun. And it is true that if the particles fall inside a closed area, right, the more likely to stay there. In a closed environment, yes, that they'd most likely generally fall within that, that area, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We may have one more. That's all right. <laughs> Apologize. If the weapon or the gun is inside, uh, in this case, the Toyota 4Runner, and it is ex it is shot, right? Bullet comes out of it, and GSR particles come out of it. Uh, can you test inside those window sills where the window goes up and down to see whether the particles fell inside? Um, if you could fit the stub down in there, then you could, but. The stub is round, so it'd be very hard to get down in there. All right. But if indeed a gun was shot in that location and the car was closed off into a very closed area, such as that windowsill, you could find those particles, correct? Could you rephrase that one sure. more time? Sorry. If, you shot, if the gun was shot inside the Toyota yeah. and GSR particles fell... Uh, I see Mr. Hagen is uh, getting up before I finish the question. He's objecting. I will overrule the objection at least to hear the question. Okay. If a gun, if the gun was shot inside this You're Toyota, hypothetically, hypothetically, assuming the gun was shot inside this Toyota, because we don't know, right? Okay. Uh, and the GSR particles. Let me do this way. We're on the headliner. Okay. Uh, so you are assuming a vehicle. I'm assuming You're a vehicle. You're assuming the windows are closed and it's a contained unit. I'm and assuming there is a gun shot. no. I'm assuming one window is open, and the rest of the windows are closed, and the gun is shot inside the car. The GSR particles could go up to the headliner. They can, yes. They can go down to the seats. Correct. They can go inside the windowsill. Correct. Okay, and you wouldn't be able to see them, correct? Correct. So if you're wiping down a car, you wouldn't be able to tell if you were wiping them off. Correct. In any event, you have to do that testing earlier, correct? When you get an evidence item. The sooner it, it diminishes, it, there's more time goes by, it diminishes the uh, trying to recover those particles. And you can't go back and retest, for instance, if there's been, gun uh, if there's been fingerprint powder put all over the gun, all um, over the car. Right, fingerprinting, wiping can remove those particles, yes. Thank you. I think I'm finished now. Okay. <laughs> For those of us who are scientifically inept, what's a micron? 
So a micron is one millionth of a meter. So if you picture a, a human hair, can range anywhere from the thickness like 30 to 100 microns in diameter. So you're talking a half a micron. It's almost like trying to find a green pea on two football fields. Kind of put in generally is something that is a micron in size visible um, to the naked eye. No. All right. Is there any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Biello. Thank you. Commonwealth. Commonwealth calls uh, Julie James. Nothing but the truth, so I'll do that. Mr. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind, could you just um, introduce yourself to the members of the jury and if you could spell your last name? Yes. My name is Julie James, and my last name is spelled J-A-M-E-S. And uh, Ms. James, uh, can you tell us by whom you're employed? Yes, I, um, I work at the Boston Police Department Crime Laboratory. And how long have you been with the Boston Police Department Crime Laboratory? I was first hired in May of 1999, so almost 18 years now. And uh, can you tell us what, you are, uh, what your current title and responsibilities are? Yes, yeah, so currently I am the criminalist four, so um, in the DNA section. So what that means is I'm the supervisor of the DNA section. Um, my responsibilities include managing the day-to-day -day operation of the DNA section, um, managing hiring of new DNA analysts, uh, managing their training program. I'm also in charge of the quality assurance program as it relates to the DNA section. Um, I do perform DNA testing on casework samples still and uh, technical review of cases. Um, I respond to crime scenes when needed and deliver uh, testimony in court um, based on my findings as well. Uh, how long have you been the technical lead um, of the DNA section at the Boston Police Department Crime Lab? So I became the technical lead in um, 2004. <coughs> and uh, have you been uh, the, the lead uh, continuously since 2004? That's correct, yes. Can you tell us what you were doing between 1999 when you first came on? Sure. So um, in 1999, I was hired as a, um, what was called then a forensic technologist. It's like the entry-level position in the laboratory. So I was doing, day-to-day, -day, I was doing DNA testing on casework samples, um, uh, interpreting DNA data, um, compiling reports with opinions, um, and conclusions and delivering testimony. Okay. Uh, Ms. James, uh, did you work uh, prior to joining the Boston Police Department? Yes, I did. And can you tell us a little bit about the work you did before you went to the Boston Police Department? Yes, I, um, right before coming to the Boston Police Department, I worked at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. So I worked in the epidemiology section there. Um, I was doing DNA testing um, on um, Blood, uh, blood samples um, related to uh, eye-related um, disease um, in elderly patients. Um, and prior to that, I worked at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, they have a research facility in the Charlestown Navy Yard. And I did um, DNA testing there on um, a genetic disease that's called neurofibromatosis type 2. So I was doing similar um, DNA work, just not in a forensic application. Um. Can you tell us about your formal education uh, beginning with your undergraduate work? Yes, so I have a bachelor's degree from Colby College um, and that's in um, cell and molecular biology and biochemistry. Um, I also have a master's degree in forensic DNA and serology. 
Have you also taken some coursework and training related specifically to the work that you do with DNA both before you joined the department and since? Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, throughout my undergrad and grad um, degrees, I took many courses related to DNA like um, molecular biology, um, genetics, molecular genetics, biochemistry, things like that. Um, certainly with my forensic DNA um, degree, I took uh, courses like forensic DNA analysis, um, statistics related to DNA interpretation and reporting. Um, since being with the crime laboratory, we also have had continuing education, so I've had the opportunity to, to go to the FBI Academy and take um, DNA uh, analysis courses there, um, crime scene interpret, um, excuse me, crime scene um, response for collection and identification of evidence. I've taken some courses related to that. Um, uh, several statistics courses related to uh, forensic DNA interpretation and things of those natures. Um, and Ms. James, uh, has during the time that you've been with the Boston Police Department, has the DNA section uh, gone through an accreditation process? Yes, several times. And uh, has it now, uh, is it an accredited lab uh, under uh, ASCLAD? It is, that's correct. And how long has that been the case? Um, the crime laboratory has been, uh, we had our first ASCLAD lab accreditation in 2002. Um, so we've had uh, inspections in 2002, 2007, 2012, and then we just finished another inspection in 2017. Um, and in, addition, in addition to that, the DNA section itself undergoes a separate inspection every other year um, uh, where um, inspected according to the, the FBI's quality assurance guidelines. Um, and we have been inspected and deemed compliant with those guidelines since 1998. So the DNA, ins the DNA inspection started in 98 and they come every other year. Um, and then sort of an added layer, the entirety of the crime lab uh, has been in inspected and deemed um, accredited since 2002. Um, how many DNA analysts work um, under your supervision? Currently, there are um, three full-time DNA analysts uh, and one person who's cross-training from another section in the DNA lab, and then we have another new employee actually starting on Monday. And uh, with the exception of the new employee on Monday, do you and the other analysts undergo regular proficiency training? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, proficiency testing, I should say. And have you successfully completed all of your proficiency testing requirements with respect uh, to your work in the DNA section? Yes, I have. Um, so, Ms. James, can you just uh, tell us briefly, uh, what, uh, tell the members of the jury, what, what, D, what is DNA? Sure. Um, so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Basically, it's a biochemical material that each person inherits from his or her parents. And for a human, it serves as a rough blueprint to an individual's growth and development. And uh, where, where do you find uh, DNA in a person? So DNA is found in most biological substances and bodily fluids, such as blood, semen, hair roots, saliva, skin cells, things like that. And what is it about DNA that can uh, make it particularly useful in a forensic setting, such as the one that you work in? So although most DNA amongst individuals is actually very, very similar, there are some portions that have been tested and shown to have variability amongst individuals in the population. So in forensic DNA analysis, we're really only interested in looking at the areas of DNA that are going to show differences between individuals so that we can distinguish one individual's DNA profile from another. And uh, can you just explain a little bit more what a profile consists of, a DNA profile? So a profile is simply a set of characteristics. Um, a physical profile is a set of physical characteristics like hair color, eye color, height, weight. Um, you could compile a set of physical characteristics and have a profile you're trying to match. Um, so a DNA profile is simply a set of DNA characteristics where we're looking at those variable areas in the DNA that I just described and de determining what characteristics are present in the evidence at those locations and then we have something to compare to a known individual um, if, if someone is uh, given to the lab. And those specific locations that you're describing actually have names attached to them, is that correct? 
That is correct. And yes. is it's some combination of either a number and letter or just number, but it's uh, almost like an address. Is, is that a fair statement? Yes. So. Yes, the locations are like an address within your DNA. Um, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in each of your cells, um, so there's 23 different sort of streets, you know, and then with, within each of the streets, there's an actual, say, house address that you're trying to zoom in on and, and test. So um, the location is actually tells exactly which chromosome we're talking about and then where exactly along that chromosome where we're trying to test. Uh, are you familiar with the term uh, PCR? Yes, I am. And uh, can you tell, uh, tell us what PCR stands for and, and how it's useful in the work that you do? Yes. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Basically, it's a biochemical um, reaction that takes place in a very small test tube. Um, and what PCR is doing, it's, it's making copies, thousands and millions of copies of those variable areas that we're interested in so that we can start out with a very small amount of DNA and actually look at the profile that is generated from that evidence. And when you talk about starting out with a small amount of DNA, for an example, that could be a questioned sample from a scene where you're trying to determine what the profile of that sample is? Absolutely. And the PCR testing allows you to photocopy or, or uh, amplify uh, that amount of DNA so that you can look at the full profile? Correct. It allows us to get information out of a sample that if we weren't able to copy, we wouldn't be able to get any information out of. And our PCR, excuse me, our PCR best, P, our PCR based tests used by the Boston Police Department DNA section? Yes, every day. And what kind of specific DNA testing does the Boston Police Department use? So the test kit that we utilize right now um, are, is called um, Identifiler Plus um, or Amphistar Identifiler Plus PCR Amplification Kit. Um, it's a kit that we buy from a vendor and it has all the um, chemicals in there to test the specific locations that we're interested in. And how many uh, locations does the Identifiler Plus look at? It looks at 16 different locations across the DNA. Um, but Ms. James, I want to direct your attention to July of 2015. Um, on that date, did you examine some evidence in connection with the July 16, 2012 shooting deaths of uh, Daniel De Abreu and Safira Furtado? Yes, I did. And specifically referring you to item 13.1, are you familiar with that item number in the, in the Boston Police Department Crime Lab? Yes, with relation to our crime lab case number 15-0116. And 15-0116 is a designation that's given by the crime lab uh, to identify specific casework? That's correct, yes. Okay. And item number 13.1, what, what item was that? So item 13.1 in relation to that case was a swab of textured areas of a revolver. And if you know, where did that come from, meaning where was it, how did from whom was it received into the DNA section? So um, crim criminalist Amy Reynolds um, swabbed the revolver and then packaged the swabbing and then submitted that particular swab uh, to the DNA section for testing. Uh, now the testing uh, that you performed uh, using the Identifiler Plus, did that consume the entire sample, that is all the swabbing that Ms. Reynolds did on, 13, on item number 13? That is correct. We used, she basically takes a, or the swab that was submitted was, we took the whole swab and, and ran it through the DNA process in an effort to get um, the most DNA recovered from the swab. And as a result of running it through the DNA process, did you uh, generate a DNA profile from item number 13.1? Yes. And of the 16 locations that the Identifiler Plus examines, at how many locations did you generate a profile? So we were able to detect um, some characteristics at only two out of the 16 locations that we attempted to get information from. And from your examination of those two locations as well as your experience, what results did you, were you able to, uh, or what conclusions were you able to draw about those characteristics at those two particular locations? 
So um, reviewing the data and the information that we um, obtained from that particular sample, um, the DNA profile detected from that swab from the textured areas of the revolver um, is consistent with being a mixture of DNA from at least one individual, um, one or more individuals. Um, results were detected at only two out of the 16 locations, as I previously stated. And the following conclusions are based on the assumption of more than one individual um, contributing DNA to this sample. Um, so no major contributor was determined uh, for the particular mixture. And as a result, um, <coughs> the DNA profile obtained from item 13.1 is unsuitable for comparison due to the low quality and low quantity of DNA uh, obtained from that sample. Ms. James, are you familiar with uh, what is uh, known as uh, touch DNA? Yes. And uh, can you just explain to the members of the jury what, what, what is meant by the term touch DNA? Yes. Um, so touch DNA is, um, it's actually sort of what it sounds like. It's um, if someone touches or handles an item, um, might they leave some cellular material or, or DNA uh, behind? That, and that's to be distinguished from DNA that you find in your blood, for instance, or, or sweat. Uh, this is actually coming from DNA that might be left behind from having physical contact uh, with the item, such as your hands. Correct. So like a blood stain on an item, um, say on this, on this um, desk right here, um, would be considered a stain and not touch DNA. You know, if, if, um, if there's a fluid left behind, you know, that would not be considered touch DNA, like semen or blood, something that um, typically has a, a um, expected high amount and high quality um, DNA. Um, and despite the name touch DNA, do you leave DNA um, behind every time you touch an object? It's possible. Okay. And um, when you say possible, uh, do you... Uh, does one leave detectable DNA or suitable DNA suitable for comparison every time you touch an object? It's, it's possible. So some, some people might handle or touch an item and leave DNA behind and some people might not. Um, uh, there's even been studies performed where an individual might leave DNA say in the morning and in the afternoon, they don't. Um, the general term is called shedder, so some people shed sort of their skin cells um, easily and other people don't. Um, but there's, vari there's variability, so sort of, you know, um, in the northeast in the winter, it's dry. People's skin are, are dry, they use more lotion or they don't. Um, those sort of variables can make a difference as to whether or not someone might shed some skin cells onto an item that they touch or handle. Um, there's also just variability within an individual if all those variables are um, fairly stable as well. So um, I guess there's sort of two, two, um, two areas to think about. You know, someone might touch something and, and leave shed, shed skin cells or not. Um, and then the second one is, you know, if you were to swab that area, you know, we can't see a stain there. We're kind of guessing if someone handled or touched this item in a normal manner of using this item, where might they handle it so that we could try to see if we can collect some skin cells from that sample. Um, but there's no way to tell if you swabbed it all up. And it, that's a difference between, you know, if there's a blood stain on an item, you can clearly tell if you collected it all off of the item. Um, with something that's like an invisible stain, like a handler or a touch type item, you're not really sure if there's anything there to begin with that you're even collecting off. And to use your example uh, of the table that's directly in front of you with respect to touch DNA, uh, is there any way to tell when the DNA, if, if you find DNA there, uh, when it was deposited or when it was left behind? No, there's really, there's no scientific method for that, um, like dating or, um, you know, determining how long any biological fluid is left behind. <clears throat> now, lastly, um, are you familiar with the term uh, low copy number? Yes, I am. And uh, if you could also explain to the members of the jury what that means. Yes. Um, so low copy number is, um, 
It's a term that's used uh, specifically with relation to the PCR or copying process that I described a few minutes ago. Um, low copy number is when uh, it's basically describing the um, phenomenon where the copying process is a very powerful process. Um, I mentioned a few minutes ago that it enables us to get information out of a very, very small amount of sample. Um, however, there is even still a limit to the copying process, so you have to, to give that PCR process a sufficient amount of starting material so that it has a reliable and reproducible result each time that you copy that sample. Uh, low copy number is referring to the situation where um, the amount of starting material you put into the copying process is very, very low. And it, it means that you may or may not get the uh, correct information out of that amplification process. So, uh, for instance, the, the kit that you use, the Identifiler Plus, does that have a rec rec recommended number of cycles of amplification or photocopying? The yes, it does, yes. Okay. And uh, l the low copy number method uh, uh, actually goes above and beyond the recommended setting or the recommended number of amplifications. Is that a fair okay. thing to say? Okay. Uh, with respect to, could you describe for us uh, the, what the low copy number method is with respect to uh, the recommended number of amplifications that you get with a particular kit? Identifiler plus. Um, yes, so um, when you purchase a particular amplification kit, in this case we utilize the Identifiler Plus kit as I previously mentioned, um, the user guide does have recommended um, what they call cycle numbers, cycles of copying, basically rounds of copying. Um, and this kit suggests 28 or 29 cycles and they, they, um, they suggest that you start with those, that's what the company designed the kit to work at most efficiently and most uh, reliably and reproducibly. And if you vary from that, um, low copy number methods add additional cycles on to that number in an effort to try to get the very limited amount of DNA in the sample to actually copy. So it needs to do more and more rounds to try to see if the DNA in the sample can show itself. And have there been some documented problems with going above and beyond the recommended number of cycles? Are you aware of problems that can occur when you go beyond the number of recommended cycles? Yes. And can you describe uh, any number of those problems to the members of the jury? Yes, so the um, there, are, there are limitations to all tests. Um, and for low copy number methods, when you're doing additional cycles, the limit, there are certain limitations to it. Um, and just um, 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 additional uh, 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 issues to be aware of um, as you're using the test. In specific, when you do additional cycles um, through the PCR or copying process, it can actually create uh, DNA characteristics that aren't truly in the sample. <clears throat> and, and is there a name for that or do you, uh, what, what do we... Yes, it, it, the, the term is called drop-in. Um, so if you, low copy number is uh, particularly susceptible to drop-in, which means that it can generate DNA characteristics that actually are not in the sample itself. And does the Boston Police Department DNA, uh, Boston Police Department Crime Lab DNA section use low copy number methodology? No, we do not. Uh, Ms. James, earlier you described um, 
uh, that uh, with respect to touch DNA, that with respect to any, uh, any particular item that you touch, you may leave DNA, you may not leave DNA. Uh, have you uh, participated in any studies within your own um, uh, laboratory with respect to touch DNA? Yes, we have. And could you explain to the members of the jury, uh, members of the jury uh, any number of the studies that you conducted with respect to that? Yes, so um, basically when you're bringing a new kit online, um, you do validation studies to learn how the kit works and the limitations of the kit in your hands and things like that. And it helps you develop how to interpret the data that you generate from it and things like that. So through those normal validation studies, we have done these sort of mimicked touch sample so things like we go to someone's desk and pick up their desk phone and swab it you know the desk phone that they use all the time and people have different levels of um, like cleanliness some people clean their work desk a lot some people don't so we kind of randomly sampled different people's desk uh, phones um, handles of you know the doors to the lab and things like that um, and just you know people's cell phones just general use items um, and basically what we found is sometimes we found the owner's DNA on those samples, sometimes we didn't. Um, we got a lot of mixtures, so multiple people's DNA present on, on samples. Um, we swabbed things like people's cat, uh, coats and jackets. We would find like their kids' DNA mixed in and um, just to give us an idea of, you know, what do these sort of general use items look like when we know how they've been handled and and how they've been, um, and who's been handling them on a regular basis. Uh, thank you, Ms. James. I have nothing further. All right, let's take our morning recess. We'll resume at 11.